countdown goes off manual and on automatic. Moves inevitably toward zero time. Three, two, one. most ridiculous statement I've ever heard is one that was attached to a splitter, splitter political party. Peace and freedom. Peace and freedom. You can have peace or you can have freedom, but you don't get both at once. Yes, I heard both the applause and the boos. The only way a man can be free is by an utter willingness to fight with the outright viciousness of one of Larry Niven's Kazin. Kaziti. The only peace that a man who won't fight ever gets is the peace of the grave. Hey, Highliners! Like a Waldo picking straight into your brain, we grok you, man. We are here to talk about Starship Troopers. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, this is uh, uh, for our 21st episode of Highliners. So uh, this is one we've been looking forward to for a long time. Finally. Uh, yeah, we're finally out of the juvenile uh, novel period for right. uh, Robert A. Heinlein. And Although this on one's to the, pretty fucking juvenile. And we're on to the very serious, very, very <laughs> serious work of Heinlein that is Starship Troopers. <laughs> Well, hey, uh, next uh, book episode, we'll have uh, Stranger in a Strange Land, and pretty soon we'll be doing Moon is a Harsh Mistress. So. And I'll fucking kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> but who are you, David? Ah, uh, I'm David Agronoff, author of Vegan Revolution with Zombies and uh, Punk Rock Ghost Story. And I'm Anthony Trevino, author of the horror comic Fruition and contributor to several pop culture outlets such as Clash and Tom Holland's Terror Time. And I am also an instructor in history and moral philosophy, <laughs> also known as how to be a pedantic fuck and blow smoke about how great the military is. <laughs> Woo, this is going to be a fire episode. Right. Uh, and who else have we got here? And I'm Langhorn J. Tweed. Right. All right. So uh, our episode today is a story versus film for Robert A. Heinlein's classic of military science fiction, Starship Troopers. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. So um, let's talk about the story and publication History, because we don't have any Heinlein news. The guy's, <laughs> yeah, the guy's really dead. All right, he's super dead. I mean, yeah, yeah, he's real he's dead. Super dead. Yeah. So, um, yeah, in 1941, uh, Robert Heinlein attempted to join the Navy, but uh, because he was really psyched for World War II. Uh, which was actually not uncommon at the time, because after Pearl Harbor, there was a lot of people that just really wanted to be a part of the war effort and fight against fascism, and which is really understandable because uh, Japan, imperialist Japan, pretty uh, scary prospect. And, and fuck Nazis. And fuck Nazis. So we understand why he wanted to do that. Uh, but um, his medical history and the various things like kept him um, out of serving in the Navy. Again, now he had been in the Navy previously in his life, so he had already done um, service in the Navy, which is important later. I'm shocked. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I'm shocked right now. <laughs> so he was hired by the military during World War II to work in the 
Aeronautical Materials Laboratory at the Naval Factory in Philadelphia. Now, this is very interesting, too. For those of you who don't know, I just recently read Astounding, which is the biography of John W. Campbell slash Robert A. Heinlein, Isaac Asimov, and, like, and L. Ron Hubbard. Now, L. Ron Hubbard had some really hilarious adventures during World War II because he tried to join the Navy, and he, like, fucked up a mission and did all this crazy stuff. You can read about it in this sounding. We're not doing the Hubbard cast. Um, and we never will. Never will. will. <laughs> uh, I might. Well, <laughs> just, just because I want to dive into that world and, and just kind of experience it. I mean, I already just got a 204-page lesson in what I got to do to be a real fucking patriot. So... Yeah, could be worse. Next, I could know how to, you know, fillet Xenu as, <laughs> as best as possible. Well, I just spent to like ten books learning what how to be a real man. It's, it's true. How to be a real man, serve your country, and um, <clears throat> just be an all-around moral character. Yeah. All right. So, but let's talk about this naval factory because holy shit, I'm okay. Oh no, 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 no. This is interesting <laughs> because. Heinlein was the manager of the plant, and, under, the, and certain people worked for him. Other people who could not get into the military but signed up, including Isaac Asimov and uh, L. Sprague uh, de Camp, who was both, they were both science fiction writers, and they worked for Heinlein there. And so there's all kinds of weird, funny stories about, because Heinlein managed the plant, and they were doing, like, basically science, like, early DARPA-type stuff, like scientific research about designing weapons and all this stuff. So think about that. There were three really famous science fiction writers during World War II working in this weird factory in Philadelphia. Nice. And so there's all kinds of weird stories, including a time where um, Isaac Asimov started uh, or signed a petition that a bunch of the Jewish workers wanted Yom Kippur off uh, in a factory, and Heinlein pulled Asimov <coughs> into the office and was like, you don't really believe in God. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was like, why did you sign this? You don't even believe in God. And then Asimov said, look, I don't mind working on Yom Kippur, but I'm still going to sign the petition because I don't think that the people who are real Jews like, should have to work on that day. But it was interesting because this was just like a really interesting time that like Heinlein was, you know, really wanted to be a part of the war effort, um, yeah. but, but wasn't. But So I think that kind of... Um, Gives us a little bit of flavor, background of where Heinlein was coming from on this. So, when Heinlein wrote Starship Troopers, he had already started Stranger in a Strange Land. But he put aside Strange Land and wrote Starship Troopers. And his motivation came when uh, the president at the time, Dwight Eisenhower, made the decision to suspend nuclear tests um, and... He, his wife uh, had shown an ad in a local newspaper. Well, it, not, not just nuclear. It, it wasn't just, it wasn't all nuclear tests. It was nuclear tests in the air. Okay, so. yeah, yeah. But, I mean, it was, it was part of, of, of what was the motivation for it. And then he saw... Well, it totally was the motivation. But, I mean, it's not like we just gave up on nuclear, nuclear testing or, or making bigger bombs or anything. Right. So he saw, his wife showed him an ad that was in a newspaper by the National Committee for Sane Nuclear Policy on April 5th, 1958, calling for the suspension, unilateral suspension of nuclear weapons testing. And this is the thing that originally inspired Heinlein to write Starship Troopers. Um, and um, since uh, you read a lot of our quotes, Larry, can you uh, read that quote that he has? The, I am convinced. I am convinced in my own mind that the United States is washed up and we will cease to exist inside of five to 15 years unless we quickly and drastically pull up our socks both at home and in foreign policy. This opinion has been growing in my mind for years. I was simply triggered into doing something about it by this pat pacifistic, internationalist, come clandestine, communist drive to have us treat atomics and disarmament in exactly the fashion 
the Kremlin has tried to get us to do for the past 12 years. Yeah, and so, so basically he was like, I'm tired of this bunch of goddamn liberal fucking hippie pussies. <laughs> and yep. this was in a pacifistic bullshit. Yeah, this was in a letter to his agent, Lurton Black. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a Philip K. Dick character. Right? <laughs> shout out to Lurton Blassing game. Yeah, shout out to Lurton. I'm going to name my How many Star times Lurton? have we had to shout out to Lurton in this uh, podcast? A lot. A lot. A lot. Yeah. A lot. A lot of letters to Lurton. Letters to Lurton. It's a funny memoir. how... 12, 20 episodes in, we're still laughing about Lurton Blazing Game. Well, I mean, I didn't name my new dog <laughs> Lurton. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, we definitely owe Lurton for this podcast. It's a great, it's a great name. Come on. Yeah. All right, anyway, let's get through more of this garbage. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have another quote uh, where, uh, from that same letter. It is an adult novel about an 18-year-old boy. Mm-hmm. I <laughs> I have followed my own theory that intelligent youngsters are in fact more interested in weighty matters than their parents usually are. I think that was him just trying to sell that like his his market was juveniles and he wrote this yeah. book. Yeah. This one wasn't going to appear in Boy's Life, I think is what he was saying. Yeah. Uh, the story was first published as a two-part serial in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction as Starship Soldier was the original title. I think Starship Troopers is a better title. Yeah. Uh, Starship Soldier sounds like a really bad early Marvel character. Starship <laughs> Soldier. What's that on the horizon, Mick? <laughs> I don't know, Tony. It's the Starship <laughs> Soldier. Oh, my God. All right. Anyways, it was published by G.P. Putnam Sons in December of 1959. Just in time for Christmas. Um, <laughs> Merry Christmas. Yeah. Um, and it was originally submitted as a juvenile novel for Scribner, who published most of Heinlein's stuff. And he had a, a lot of YA books with Scribner. Um, but the manuscript was rejected. And Heinlein, uh, that was the end of Heinlein's association with the publisher and Really, his uh, last uh, attempt at writing juvenile yeah. novels, and he went to. Um, and a lot of people think that uh, Scribner's rejection was based on the ideological objections, basically to all the same ones you're going to hear coming out like venom from the guy on the left of me <laughs> throughout here. And, and look, I don't think any none of hey us. Hey, man, I didn't want to read a book that spent two hundred four fucking pages telling me join the military. It's great. <laughs> Well, look, and what, um, yeah, I don't think any of us were, like, super into the jingoistic nationalism of, 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 um, Starship. Not his, no. No. Um, but, uh, and we have another quote there, um, Larry. Oh, yeah, what, me? Yeah. I must pause to brush off those parlor pacifists I mentioned earlier. <laughs> yeah. For they contend that their actions are on this highest moral level. They want to put a stop to war. They say so. Their purpose is to save the human race from killing itself off. They say that, too. Anyone who disagrees with them must be a bloodthirsty scoundrel, and they'll tell you that to your face. Yeah, that's another quote. Um, this one, that one. Six. Yeah. There's, there's more there, and this comes from a speech he gave to a brigade of midshipmen at the U.S. Naval Academy in 1973. I won't waste, waste <laughs> time <laughs> trying to judge their motives. My criticism is of their mental processes. Their heads aren't screwed on tight. They live in a world of fantasy. Let me stipulate that if the human race managed its affairs sensibly, we could do without war. Yes, and if pigs had wings, they could fly. <laughs> wow, Heinlein. Tell us what you really think about pacifists. Right. <laughs> um, so it should not come as a surprise that Starship Troopers is the way that it is. Yeah. Considering the way Heinlein... Full-on warmonger. Yeah. 
Nonetheless, um, the book was awarded the 1960 Hugo Award for Best Novel. Interestingly, it was not the only military sci-fi novel on the ballot that year. Dorsai, D-O-R-S-A-I, hmm. by Gordon R. Dickinson. Was also Dixon. Dixon, <laughs> sorry. Dixon, um, you, as you, you all are familiar with him as the guy on the shelf where you wish there were a bunch of PKD books when you look, <laughs> but there, instead there's three books of Gordon R. Dick, Dixon books. He's um, not that, he, I mean, I've read some Dixon, it's not bad. Yeah, I am planning to, after I saw that this book was nominated with military sci-fi, I put a hold on it at the library, I'm going to check it out at some point. So, um, so yeah, there's, um, there's, that's the uh, publishing history of the uh, Starship Troopers. Basically, Heinlein was pissed off and wrote a book with a bunch of speeches in it because he thought hippies were bad. Because man. <laughs> right, and this was pre-hippies. I mean, he was pissed before the hippies even existed. Yeah. Really. So, well, this is the part of the show where Anthony does the, the story, story breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. How you gonna do, Anthony? Oh, I don't know. Here it comes. <laughs> so this book we always look forward to Anthony's so, story. So this book the best opens, part of the show. This book fucking opens with some war with some war going on. There's a bunch of assholes in mech suits jumping around on hopping on their big zero G boots. Bugs. As I mean, <clears throat> bugs. Are they fighting bugs? <laughs> In the beginning, well, no, they're just blowing shit they're up. Just blowing shit up. They're <laughs> hopping from house to house, and and we are introduced to Rico, who is the Swap. main character. And does he have a last name? He probably does, and I just did. It's Rico. It's Johnny that Johnny is his Johnny last Rico. name. Uh, okay, that shows you how much I gave a shit about this character. His name is Juan, actually. Juan, Juan Rico. Juan Rico. Juan anyway, Rico. so we're he's following in the Juan Rico bouncing around on his zero G boots like he's in fucking Jupiter ascending. <laughs> um, just the shit's exploding, it's a bunch of action wanking, some people die, and in the... <laughs> action wanking. I want to do that. And after this chapter ends, we do a, a flashback to when uh, Johnny Rico and his buddy are deciding, you know what, maybe we should join the service. We're young, we're agile, but really, I kind of want to join because this chick I have the hots for, that we, I had the hots for in high school joins, and that's what's the deciding factor of why I'm going to join. That felt like the only authentic thing to me in this book. <laughs> um, anyway, so Rico joins the military, and I don't know how you guys are going to feel about the way I'm doing this, but listen, this is Johnny Rico, this is Starship Troopers, Colon, Johnny Rico goes to boot camp. I have to read about all of his experiences in boot camp. He goes, he signs up, he goes to fucking boot camp. His parents are like, hey, I didn't fucking ask you to go to boot camp. His dad's super pissed off about it. His mom disowns him. They're like, we're not talking to you because you, you left and joined the military and we asked you not to. Turns out later on, we find out that his dad um, was just jealous that his son went to boot camp. And he did, which is a really funny theme about this book is... I'm just mad that you could have, you were more of a man than I was, son. That's but bullshit. more on that later, because Johnny Rico's mom yeah, looks like Carlo Nelson in the movies here. <laughs> <laughs> but more on that later, because um, while Johnny Rico's in boot camp, or I don't know, dicking around, fucking hopping on some zero G boots. I don't know what they do in the in the roughnecks. Dude, that was a full mech suit. It's not just boots. Oh no, it's Space Marines. Yeah, Space Marines. Yeah. I know what it is. Sit the fuck down, David. <laughs> Oh, man, you always do that to me during the story <laughs> breakdown. Um. Anyway, we 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 go. We follow Johnny Rico through a boot camp. He watches. He watches a dude get his ass whipped. You know, basically publicly flogged because he punched a, a superior officer who gives a shit. There's a bunch of like philosophical wanking that Heinlein does in all these chapters about. Hmm. When you're going against what it means to be a man of your country, Ugh. you can only deserve to be beaten. 
Johnny Rico takes a bunch of classes in um, history and moral philosophy. Right? Those are exciting. Yeah, oh, oh they're so exciting. I, I was riveted. I literally, it's taken me months to finish this book because I read two pages and go, I don't need this. <laughs> so <clears throat> his mom sends him a letter. Hey, I love you, blah, blah, blah. Later on, she gets fucking blasted away because they go to Buenos Aires and... Um, on gets vacation. attacked, dad stays behind, mom goes to Buenos Aires, aliens attack it, it shit blows up, she's dead, right? Um, <clears throat> we get more training, Rico graduates, and this is when we decide to talk more about the bugs, which are basically just arachnid aliens. Am I wrong? Communists. Um, I love to kill bugs. <laughs> they fight some bugs, they fight the aliens, um, more... Uh, Communist then, bugs. Guys, I'm, yeah, basically. I am not kidding. There are so many fucking chapters in this book where it's just, I'm a teacher. I'm teaching you your moral philosophy and what it means to be a, a, a fucking space marine and to yep. die for your country. It's just pages and pages speech of, this, of speech and, and monologuing. It's like a weird alternate universe Aaron Sorkin that I don't like. <laughs> well, now we know why, right? We know exactly why now because we talked about it. Uh, Rico becomes a fucking officer uh, in, you know, the, the, there's some, some boring shit there. Rico. <laughs> anyway, well, finally in the third act of the book, uh, Rico and some other, and this is honestly where the book starts for me, is Rico and a couple other guys get assigned to be, uh, what are they, I believe they're lieutenants? They're like their temp, they get assigned to a higher ranking temporarily. Because a bunch of people because got died. a bunch of people yeah. done got killed. Yeah, and um, they get sent out because they're doing whatever. They gotta capture all the bugs, and then they capture the bugs. We gotta get the queen. Yeah, man. Whatever. <laughs> and so they get they they get the queen. Rico graduates fucking Yay. Space Marine College. His dad serves with him because I no, under him. Uh, yeah, that's what I meant. He serves with him, but he's under him. Um, and what I didn't mention is that at some point, Rico and his dad reconnect, and he's like, oh, son, I joined up after you joined up. It's really fucking pathetic that the dad decided after all these years after his son joined the military that he was just so fucking heartbroken by it, and he was such, I don't know, in Heinlein's view, a fucking puss. puss. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Giant pussy. I mean, that's pretty much Heinlein's, what Heinlein is saying is in this book. But it's but, not... The character says that about himself. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, and then, Sorry I was a pussy. You know what? Like I said, he graduates Space Marine College. His dad serves under him, and they're they're going to go attack more bugs, and the book is over. And um, I literally would rather just go yank all my teeth out than have to read this fucking book again. So <laughs> that's my breakdown. That's my Yay! take breakdown. Yeah, take breakdown. Woo! All right, so um, that's your reaction. Let's talk about some of the reactions from the sci-fi community at the time, because even though it won the Hugo, not everyone was pleased. As a matter of fact, uh, the founding editor of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, Tony Boucher. Shout out to Tony Boucher. Shout out to Tony Boucher. Felt that it was an attempt for Heinlein to rationalize and condone a fascist state. Um, he and then Alan Brown of Tor.com recently uh, did an article looking back on Star Trek Troopers, and he said, Heinlein went out of his way to portray a military where people of all colors, nationalities, and creeds serve without prejudice, a world where all were treated equally, and the only race that matters is the human race. This stood in stark contrast to the Navy of Heinlein's day, where sailors were segregated, uh, given different duties based on race. And that is basically the only positive thing you can say. Well, about, you right? know, and women as well. Yeah, yeah that women just... were a part of it. And so I, I pointed that out. I wanted to point that out because there, it, I, I don't want to paint this as that everything about what Heinlein was trying to make a point about was bad. There was some few glimmers of positivity here in there. Um, in there. But, and, it's so naively optimistic. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest problem with it. It's like, yo, only uh, military people will only do the everything that's right. Well, yeah, basically, it, it has this very... We can only trust military. Because everyone right. else is just out for themselves. But military people well, well, are I, I, here I, to save us this, all. This part of the book really encapsulates just 
what fucking like pro military, pro masculinity, pro you know, just this weird yeah. idea about just being a goddamn man. This 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 section of the book just encapsulates the whole book, and it's happening when they're in their moral history and philosophy class. Major Reed paused to touch the face of an old-fashioned watch, reading its hands. The period is almost over, and we have yet to determine the moral reason for our success in governing ourselves. Now continued success is never a matter of chance. Bear in mind that this is science, not wishful thinking. <laughs> the universe is what it is, not what we want it to be. To vote is to wield authority. It is the supreme authority from which all other authority derives, such as mine to make your lives miserable once a day. Force, if you will. The franchise is force, naked and raw. The power of the rods in the axe. Whether it is exerted by 10 men or by 10 billion, political authority is force. Oh my god, I can't handle Heinlein's book of just like, whoa, everything <laughs> is just so fucking America! Yeah, right. Well, and look, he, he he does a lot of things where he talks about... One of the main points that Heinlein was trying to make with this book, right or wrong, was that um, he believes... He had this belief that you should serve to get the right to vote. Yeah. And that is one of the main messages of the book. And then you have, like... in Okay, so I read the Ace edition, the Ace paperback from 87... Was the version I got, and um, all that stuff that we had the quotes from him talking to the Naval Academy, he basically from page one forty five to one forty six, he has in the in the class the major is basically explaining. Um, you know, he talks about revolution, armed uprising. He's talking about he runs the Korean War, and he basically says the whole thing about pacifism, yeah, like outright. He just comes right out and says it. So. And here's the thing. I do not agree with any of the politics of Starship Troopers. In fact, um, I'm dead set against the politics <laughs> of it. That doesn't keep me from enjoying it as a science fiction novel. For myself, I'm definitely not on the same page as, as Anthony on that. Um, I disagree with it wholeheartedly, but I like certain things about this novel. Yeah, I just um, don't appreciate the point of view. I mean, bouncing. Uh, I like bouncing through a city, just blowing shit up. Yeah, th those are fun parts of it, and um, yeah. So let's talk about some moments. Let's go back a little bit. We've already we've summed up like some of the the problems with it. Let's talk about some of the things that I think are neat about this novel. Um, and I, yeah, I just said neat. Um, <laughs> some things that are cool. as long as you don't say cute, everything's fine. <laughs> There's um. Uh, so on page 18 of, of my edition, um, it's from their, their first battle, um, and he basically says, uh, sorry, I can't see my highlighted, uh, in this light, I can't see that my highlighter is so dull, so, so I'm finding, a hard time finding the quote. Um, so basically, he gets the, the beacon call, and he, he says something about it being the sweetest sound. Um, is the beacon, but in this whole scene, you've got like the the giant mech suits, and you're jumping around, and the action and all this is really good. Yeah. But it's for me, it's less about like the big action parts, but it's those moments like the the sound of the beacon, and like the feelings that they get. The things that I like about this novel are that um, I do think Heinlein is capturing the feeling of war novels from that time, from the World War Two novels. If I don't know how many of those Anthony's read, but I've read a Tran of Transposing it into the science fiction world? Is it? Right. So even though this is not a real war, this is a totally fictional war, I think these parts of the novel are my favorite parts because they feel lived in. They feel like something that, when I'm reading this, I, I, I get a feeling of, like, that I'm reading something that happened. Well, yeah, it even starts that way when he, he's talking about the shakes. You know, that's like a great moment of just yeah the uh, feeling of being a soldier and, and yeah, which is um, a great opening line. I always get the shakes before a drop. I've had the injections, of course, in the hypnotic preparation. It stands to reason that I can't really be afraid. I love that yeah. opening line. That's great. It, it sort of, it, it sort of is the same thing that Spielberg did with the uh, with 
the the storm of Normandy Saving Beach Ryan. and Saving Private Ryan. You know, you see all the soldiers looking really tense and, and and throwing up and the fear in their eyes and everything. Sure, and that's great. And I would have loved more that novel, of, yeah, more of that <laughs> novel, and more of seeing some people kind of question what they're doing before fully giving in to this fucking bullshit fascist like mindset. Yeah, but no I, one, no one nowadays likes to be lectured at about I, anything. I, I, I literally, I literally felt like this movie was just like, hey, or not movie, excuse me. Let's get. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there. Literally felt like this book was just like, hey, man, <laughs> what'd you do for your country today? And I looked at the book and said, mind your own goddamn business. <laughs> I can see you literally do that. <laughs> mind yeah. your own goddamn business, book. Well, and so, like, on page 23, he says, you know, he has this part where the dad's talking to him, and he says, you know, we've outgrown wars. This planet is now peaceful and happy, and we enjoy good enough relations with other planets. So what is the so-called federal service, par uh, parasitism, pure and simple, uh, functionless organ? And so you get, you get, you know, dad presenting the, the, the pinko liberal right. view. And, um, but what's really interesting in the sense of like, you know, when, when, um, when you get to like all the things about the violence of boot camp and which, you know, is throughout the book. Now, I know a lot of this seems really cliche to us now because we all live in a post full metal jacket world where we had, okay. you know, probably the most insane half an hour of showing the dehumanization that you know boot camp yeah. is designed to be right to turn people and turn these men boys and young boys into killers into killing machines and to strip them down of all this stuff but this was years this was decades before full metal jacket so whereas anthony found this boring um, I did. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, because I I don't think it. I mean, it is, oh, dude. It is. It's boring, but it's also just being lectured at. It's fucking yeah. pedantic lecturing at the reader. It's it's just one big hard on it, to the military. It's insulting and, and at the I, same time. Yeah, right? exactly. And I can I can be down for a novel that's lived in, and I can respect that aspect of it, but. That, that shit doesn't jive with me, regardless of whether or not it doesn't fall into line with my own personal ethics. It's just, it's a fucking slog to get through. I've read stuff that doesn't fall in line with my own personal beliefs that's still okay and still readable, but this is just page after page of, of you're in boot camp getting beat up because that's what we do as bros, and then we jump back <laughs> into, hey, welcome back to the have moral, and moral philosophy class. I'm going to tell you all the reasons why um, you need to just fucking be the alpha, and why being an alpha is the most important thing in this game, which I right. guess is true in the military, but I don't, I don't know, you guys. This shit sucked. <laughs> that, that's where I'm at. This shit sucked. I completely disagree with, obviously, I don't like the politics that are involved here. Sure. But for me, um, I think this is a window into the way Highline thought at the time. Yeah. And I find that interesting. I find, um, I think that... It's a window. It's more like a door, though. Isn't yeah. It? I mean, he's it's just... more of a door into what he was thinking. Right. He's basically but, just writing a bunch of, a series of essays on what he thinks about things. Right. And it's a little on the nose, and it's a little... A little? It's a little? <laughs> it's a sledgehammer on the nose. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. This is like the reverse Purge movie... Uh, where I'm just getting pummeled over and over again with its fucking message. Right, but you still go to see the Purge movies? Well, look, I saw them all. Because you said it with pure hate. Because I hope that one day they just admit what they are and just go full crazy with an idea and be fun and let the message be the backdrop and not just fucking right. dick punch me with it constantly. <laughs> Watch The Running Man and just do that for the purge. <laughs> Fuck. Well, yeah, I mean, the thing is... is or that I mean, add a character named Dynamo, because <laughs> that's my favorite part of The Running Man. <laughs> well, see, the thing is, is if somebody who... My favorite part of The Running Man is that the dance is named after it. 
<laughs> so, anybody who didn't have the views that Heinlein had is probably not going to write this kind of novel, and that's good and bad. I mean, in the sense of, like, I think it's interesting to see a science fiction novel through the lens of the way he was thinking, because most science fiction is on the left side of the political aisle. I mean, you're saying the same thing you said on the fucking Puppet Masters episode. Right? Right. You just, just excuse, making excuses left and right. <laughs> well, you can say that. I'm not, I'm not, I don't agree with Heinlein. I don't, I don't like his views, but, but, the, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that this book couldn't be written by somebody with a left leaning. And if you want a military sci-fi novel that has left leaning politics, there was a fantastic rebuttal to this book about 15 year, 14 years later in John Handelman or Joe Handelman's The Forever War. And The Forever War is a far superior novel <laughs> to Starship Troopers. And it was written by somebody who had just came back from the Vietnam War. I mean, Dean Kutz's Phantoms is a far superior novel. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just talking about military sci-fi at this moment. Uh, okay. Okay. But Joe Handelman served in Vietnam. He was an infantryman. He came back and he wrote The Forever War, and it is a great fucking book. And um, he said at the time that after coming back from real war, he wanted to respond to... He wanted to write something that was the antithesis of Starship Troopers. Even though he liked Starship Troopers as a novel, he just went to war and had the exact opposite experience. Right. So I highly recommend to everyone who's listening to this that if you have not read The Forever War, read The Forever War. Ridley Scott owned the film rights, came close to making a 3D version of The Forever War. It didn't end up happening. It's too bad. This is a great book. Hmm. Um, and then another one, a 21st century kind of uh, response to Starship Troopers is, of course, Scalzi's Old Man's War, which is a fucking great trilogy of, of military sci-fi. So, if you don't want the indoctrination into um, the anti-pacifism, you can read those. Uh, now, look, I'm not saying that if you're pro-military, I don't like you, but what I am saying is that in this book, it's so pro-military, it never... Johnny Rico never fucking questions what he's being told. It, it seems very unrealistic. Well, you're not supposed to. Well, but... Let me say it! Oh my god. That's part of the whole point. Well, I know that that's the part of the whole point. The exorcist just came But, <laughs> but it, it, it just... It's too much. Yeah. It, this book is... The shirt it is Walmart. That's what that's what I'm talking about. That idealism, idealism, that super optimistic idealism he's talking about. Right. Throughout this is that everything works on these pure levels that don't exist. Right. There is no, you know, there is no purely just doing your job and never thinking about the consequences. This shirt, or sorry, this book is the shirt sure. I saw at Walmart. Of the Statue of Liberty riding a fucking motorcycle over the American flag with a fucking eagle etched onto it. Okay, right. that's what this book is. It's a it's it's a fucking pro military Walmart T-shirt. It's an AK forty seven decal sitting on the back of a truck. Yeah. All right. Can we get into some uh, cool moments of sci-fi just to uh, balance this out a little yeah. bit? We'll talk more about the war. Fucking uh, space marines, man. Um, I love on page 81 of my edition, of Day's edition, um, when he talks about the suits. Um, mm -hmm. And I like uh, the muscles, the pseudo musculature get all the publicity, but it's the control of all that power which merits it. The real genius is the design. It, uh, of, in the design is that you don't have to control the suit, you just wear it, like clothes, like skin. Any sort of ship you have to learn to pilot, it takes time. A new set. Um, a new full set of reflexes, a different and artificial way of thinking. Even riding a bicycle demands acquired skill, very different from walking. Whereas a spaceship, oh brother, I won't live that long. Spaceships are for acrobats who are also mathematicians. I love that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but a suit you just wear. So that is like some like really cool right. No one can deny that Heinlein is a good writer. You can disagree with yeah. I mean, obviously, he's a good yeah. writer. Now, he made a, this book is a good lot. Good being an understatement. 
there. Yeah, this is, an, I don't, do not consider this one of his better books in the sense of, I mean, it's good in a lot of ways, and it won the Hugo, but I think that he had a lot of better books that yeah. are written because this one is so preachy that that is a huge problem with it. Um, but you, you've got, like, really cool moments like that. Uh, however, there are also moments where, like, Johnny Rico, um, uh, on page 123 of my edition, which is like the exact opposite of good, good writing, where he <laughs> says, um, but I can tell you what sort of planet it is. Like Earth, but retarded. <laughs> Literally <laughs> retarded. Like a kid who takes 10 years to learn to wave bye-bye and never manages to master patty cake. Yep. Whoa. Whoa, doggy. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? But I know he was speaking and was writing as a grunt there, so I will let him get away with yeah, it. Yeah, it's a, a character thing. Yeah, I mean, that's, I guess, sort of okay in that context. But it is just really interesting, because when I read that, I was just like, whoa, I don't remember that from the first time I read it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there is some interesting stuff about um, about what to call the war. <laughs> Uh, That's just funny. Yeah, yeah. The whole um, hold on, it's on page one hundred four of uh, Ace Edition. Um, I don't see any mention of how the Terran Federation moved from peace to a state of emergency and then on to war. I didn't notice. I didn't notice it too closely myself. When I enrolled, it was peace, the normal condition. At least people thought so. And then he goes on to say. The historians can't seem to settle on whether to call this one the third space war or the fourth, or whether it's the first interstellar war that fits better. We just call it the, the bug, bug war. war. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great moment in the book. Right. Um, and uh, But when he kept talking about the third or fourth war, there's a, there's a, a thrash crossover band from New York from the late 80s called Carnivore. It's the dude from Typo Negative's first band. And they have a song called World Wars 3 and... or World War 4 and 5 is the name of the song. Nice. And I, I just kept thinking of that song. <laughs> I read that part. It's like the last part of the song is after World War 3, if you're still alive, we'll get you in World Wars 4 and 5. <laughs> I just kept thinking of that line for some reason, but... Anyways, I think that's, I mean, that's all the parts that I have. Let's get to the movie. Yeah, let's get to the movie. So, uh, yeah, the pre -product, the production and pre-production of Starship Troopers, the movie, which, so, originally, this the studio, TriStar Columbia, had a script for a movie that was called Bug Hunt at Outpost 9. And they actually awesome. tried to sell this to the studio, and then the, and somebody at the studio was like, "Have you read Starship Troopers?" <laughs> uh, because this sounds a lot like Starship Troopers. And um, so then, Paul Verhoeven and his screenwriter Ed Newmeyer, who had written RoboCop with, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, <laughs> he's pretty much all he's written is Starship Troopers movies, RoboCop. Yeah, and and yeah, so they hired um, Ed Newmeyer and Paul Verhoeven to adapt to take uh, um, Bug Hunt at Outpost Nine and turn it into Starship Troopers, kind of meld them and adapt the book. Mm. And Paul Verhoeven tells um, kind of a funny story that uh, let's see if I can find the quote. Um, he said, I stopped after two chapters because it was so boring. So, hey, hey, Verhoeven's with hey me and Paul Verhoeven have the same opinion, and I'm going to side with the fucking director of RoboCop. Yeah, right. he, he said, it is really quite a bad book. I asked Ed Newmeyer to tell me the story because I couldn't read the thing. It was very right-wing book. So, um, he still took the job to make the movie. But though I did see another interview, I don't have this quote. You know, he had to have that satirical seed in his head, though, when he was like, "Wait a second, I can make this movie, but I'll 
fuck that book up. Yeah, right. And so he, they basically, instead of adapting Starship Troopers, they basically made a satire of the book in a lot of ways. Um, it, and it's more faithful than I, when I rewatched the movie last night, it was a little bit more faithful than I had expected from my memory of it. Well, that there's there's events that come straight out of the book. Really? Like like what? <sighs> well, just things like like there's a war. <laughs> <laughs> well, Buenos Aires is getting blown up, and and just, it's just there, there's like a few. Yeah, but they don't live there, and both his parents don't die there, and yeah, I mean, well, what I think they did smartly was they definitely hollow ho- Hollywoodized. The story much more. They created arcs for the characters. They deepened the other characters. They combined a bunch of the characters. Yeah. But if you think about it, Michael Ironside's still giving all the speeches from the class. He's doing all the things. And Michael Ironside had read Starship Troopers when he was a kid and asked for Hoven, like, why the hell do you want to do this? Basically, like the first time they met about it. Really? And Verhoeven pitched to Ironside that he's basically going to satirize it. You know, yeah, um, and because I guess they were buds after doing Total Recall together, and um, you know, interesting. Do we know what Michael Ironside thought of the book? Um, the quote. I think I have a quote here. Awesome. Uh, God, I love Michael Ironside. <laughs> he, um, I don't have the quote, but I did read a quote where he was. He was quoted as saying, I think it's in the IMDb trivia if you want to find the exact quote. Hmm. But, um, but he did basically say that, that he had read it as when he was a kid and that he went to Verhoeven and didn't think it matched Verhoeven's sensibilities, basically. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. Right. Yeah. But um, he said it in a way cooler way because he's Michael Ironside and I'm not. Michael fucking Ironside. Michael fucking Ironside. And, um, but remember... You know, okay, so they had, um, let's see, they had a budget of $105 million to make this movie. And at times, the special effects, like especially the bugs, look awesome. Uh, some of the space special effects and some of the, like, flying, like, the, like especially the shuttle, the, the, the escape hatch shuttle, yeah. looks terrible. Um, but... The film was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Visual Effects. So, nice. Academy Award nominated Starship Troopers. <laughs> <laughs> um, in 1998. So, the movie came out in 1997. And I have friends that were in this movie. So, Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. There was a lot of extras. Yeah. In this movie. <laughs> um, uh, probably my favorite... Uh, there's a lot of weird little cameos in the movie from different actors. First of all, Jake Busey playing... That's not a cameo. Well, yeah, he's a supporting character at them. He's right. a supporting character, but... I don't know if there's cameos. There's... Rue McClanahan. Good. One of, the golden, <laughs> one of the golden girls who plays the, uh, oh, right. the biologist <laughs> who leads the dice set. No, that's, that's a good cameo there. That is a great cameo. Um and it probably wasn't a cameo just because he wasn't a big actor, but he became a big actor <laughs> later, which is, um, I think his name, Dean Norris, the guy who was the brother-in-law in Breaking Bad. Yes, that is Dean Norris. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah he plays the commander right. who, who accepts uh, Rico's um, resignation before Buenos Aires gets blasted. Yep. And, um, yeah, and, and there's all kinds of really weird and funny things in this movie. Clancy fucking Brown is Hell, in Hell, yeah. That's <laughs> my dude. Pet Cemetery 2's Clancy Brown. <laughs> uh, always be the Kurgan for me. So. Verhoeven uh, stated in 1997 that the first scene of the film, the advertisement for the mobile infantry, was a shot-for-shot ad- adaptation of Triumph of the Wills, the propaganda, the Nazi propaganda film. Yeah, that was brilliant. Yeah, that was... Um, I mean, that's film school brilliant, but it's brilliant nonetheless. Well, and you got to think that on the level, he's satirizing Heinlein um, as on the nose. Yep. <laughs> as Heinlein was right yeah, in the novel. That's, that's true. <laughs> and you have some 
some really funny moments. Like, first of all, everybody in in the movie is supposed to be in high school, and they're like thirty two years old, um, which is yeah. not right. uncommon at the time. Uh, Verhoeven did say that he did originally want to cast younger actors that looked younger, and he was basically only given the option to do that with the kids who replaced them at one of the bug battles towards the end. You know, there's all like, the the much younger kids, and yeah. Enrico is walking past, and he's like, "Look at these young kids." Um, with Casper Dean, uh, the act, the lead actor, Casper Van Dean, Casper Van Dean, <laughs> who, like everyone else in this movie, is super subtle. Yeah, <laughs> about everything. <laughs> um, you also have uh, Neil Patrick Harris, uh, Doogie Hauser, playing um, uh, the. Uh, I believe Barney. everyone knows him as Barney Stinson now. Yes, but um, although I have, I have per, in, in person called him Doogie Hauser, and he, know for a fact he does not like that. Um, well, on the set, apparently, when he was wearing his very Nazi-looking uniform as the um, military intelligence guy, right. everyone on the set called him Doogie Himmler. Oh man, <laughs> <laughs> I read that That's in the trivia. Awesome. <laughs> Doogie Himmler. Yes. Um, and you know who actually I think had the best performance of the movie? Like honestly, a really good performance is Diana Meyer, who plays Dina. Dizzy. Dina Meyer. Dina Meyer, who plays Dizzy. Um, yeah, she did. She was the best performance in the movie. I thought. She is definitely the best performance in the movie, and we'll get back into Dizzy here in a little bit because we definitely have hot takes on on uh, Dizzy versus Carmen. So. Um, Okay, so Dizzy is a dude in the uh, in, in the, the book. book. Yeah, Dizzy is definitely a dude in the book. Um, which you know kind of goes with. And I, I don't believe they make sweet love in the uh, in the book. <laughs> no, they definitely do not make. I don't think love. that was a that well. No. Highline does have some weird sex stuff, but I don't think it goes that direction. Yeah, next episode when we do Stranger in a Strange Land, we'll yeah. talk about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, that book is so long. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so we got um, now another thing. I forgot to mention this too. That Heinlein does consider this a part of a thematic trilogy: um, the Starship Troopers with Stranger in a Strange Land and um, Moon is a Harsh Mistress as his really libertarian um, themed books. Huh. And but that, the, those are his backpedaling books. What are you talking? <laughs> like all of his books from. This point on are libertarian. libertarian, but he considered these three the the the, the, the most. most libertarian. Yeah. So okay, I don't know. Maybe you can cut that out and put that back into the book section. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to mention that. A anyways, um, so some cool things going on with the film. Like uh, definitely, all the fake ads are hilarious. Yeah, like the ads with the "Do you want to know more?" and like the the it was kind of like during the proto internet. Like, I was surprised to see those menus that look like websites. Yeah. I wasn't sure. I mean, we had websites at that point, so we were starting to, yeah. I mean, but yeah, they the didn't look, existed. but they did yeah. not look anything like the, they did in the movie. Right. And they do look more in the movie like modern, like, yeah, like modern day, the, like DVD menus and stuff like that, which yep. definitely did not exist at the time. Um, and so, yeah, we got a lot of cool things going on there with that. Are there any other actors, like side characters or things that I'm missing there, uh, Larry, with your IMDb? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think there's anything really worth mentioning in the cast and crew. Um, so, yeah, the design was definitely not subtle to make it look like... Um, uh, like Nazis. <laughs> right. Um, and... Uh, so obviously in the movie they didn't have the money to do the giant mech suits in 1997. Um, we have seen those in movies since then. The, I think of uh, Edge of Tomorrow with Tom Cruise, looks like, yep. the, like the mech suits. That I think of in Starship Troopers. So that was definitely a limitation of the budget that they had then. So you know, but he also he sort of worked that into it thematically as well. Instead of having them be these badass soldiers, they were just fodder. And that sort of worked to go against what the, the book says as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, they are definitely just, like, the, the amount of limbs that get cut off in this movie. Right, right. And, and the fact that their guns do jack shit. Yeah, and by the way, they sh- uh, um, according to IMDb, this is the movie that had the most amount of ammo fired in it. Really? Like, so of, of any movie at the time. So, I mean, there's a fuckload. And, and the, the pulse rifles, by the way, do look exactly like the guns in... Um, or like some of the guns and aliens, and yeah, right. Appreciate that, um, but uh, yeah. So um, so let's talk about so differences. Well, are we there yet? Well, let's talk. Yeah, because then we can get into Dizzy and Carmen and the differences. Yeah. So yeah, this movie is very different from the book. Um, it the entire tone just basically makes fun of and kind of laughs at the book, but... Right. Now, I'm sure we all... Did we all see this movie before reading the book? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I saw this movie. I saw this movie in theaters long before I read the book. Right. Um, I did, I did too. I did not. I mean, a couple years, like a year or two before I read the book the first time, so... When the movie got... When I first read about this movie being in production, because um, I was already a fan of RoboCop and Verhoeven and Total Recall, mm-hmm. I... When I saw that this was in production, I think I read about it in like Cinescape or one of those magazines that nice. you, that you found out about movies before the internet. Shout out to Cinescape. Yeah. <laughs> so I went and I, my first time reading Starship Troopers was like the month before the movie came out. I went, ah. I went and read it. Um, really? At the time. And I did see Starship Troopers on opening night and I wasn't, because I had read the book and I was, un- <laughs> I was uncomfortable with the book in 1997 because I was right. politically aware enough to be kind of uncomfortable with it. And, like, I wasn't entirely sure what to make of the movie, but in the end, I, I was so ready to be kind of offended. I was expecting to get Independence Day, too, basically, because yeah. Independence Day, I don't know if Anthony is even old enough to remember this, but when Independence Day came out in the theater, like people were fucking chanting USA in the theater. Oh, I mean, really? I don't remember that. I remember <laughs> seeing Independence Day in when it was released in the summer of whenever that was. And I only remember it because we were so late that me and my, my friends had to sit not only on the floor at the front of the movie theater, but like laying down so we could look up at the screen. <laughs> so that's that's what I remember about I, ID. Here's what I remember that about that. Welcome to Earth. Here's what I remember about that movie. I got everyone to clap when the uh, White House blew up. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, yeah, this was very soon after ID4. and Where were you living when that? I was in Syracuse. Okay. I saw this movie in Syracuse at the Carousel Center. Shout right. out to the Carousel Center. <laughs> which, by the way, the free was... free theater. The free theater. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, um, this movie theater had a really terrible system for taking tickets and you could just walk right in. And so basically from 1996 to 1999 in Syracuse, we just walked in to movies for free there. Nice. And so I, uh, I'm sure they fixed that. I'm sure they fixed that. I, it, they let it go for a long time. <laughs> I don't know if we have any listeners out there in uh, Syracuse, uh, let me know if you can still walk in free to the carousel center mall. I know it's not called Carousel Center anymore, but whatever. Anyways, um, but yeah, I saw Starship Troopers when I was in Syracuse. And when I saw Independence Day, people were chanting USA, USA. And so when I walked into the theater to see this movie, I was expecting that. So Chinguistic bullshit. So when it was like so hilariously over the top of satire, I I loved it immediately. Right. I, 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 but I immediately thought it was a comedy and thought it was really funny. And I remember... Yeah. Yeah, my girlfriend at the time, Nicole, was just like, I don't think she just didn't like because there was like fucking guts and bodies and, you know, like the scene where they're like pulling the head with a giant hole in it and going, right. they definitely got inside his brain. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then they just like keep shaking the body. I like things like that. I don't think she, she dug it. So I have a very distinct memory of me liking it and her hating it. So... Um, yeah, yeah the, I, when I saw it, it was just I, I loved this movie. Where were you living when you saw Starship Troopers? San Diego, San Diego. Okay. Yeah, I was in San Diego. I saw it down at the um, Mission Valley Theater. Cool. With a bunch of people. 
All right, I don't think Anthony was alive enough to have seen <laughs> Starship Troopers. <laughs> you were alive. Yeah, I saw Starship Troopers in theaters. You did? Yeah, the yeah. How old were you? Didn't he, didn't he just say he saw yeah. it when sitting when in front of the theater? theater? 97. Yeah, so that would have been like seventh grade for me. Oh, okay. or seventh grade. Perfect time to see yeah. Starship Troopers in the movie. Um, yeah, so do you remember what theater you saw it in? Grossmont Center. Yeah. Okay. Yep. In in uh, the old the, the old Grossmont Center. Yeah, theater? the old one, which is now it's a not Panda there Express. Anymore? It's just on the other side. Yeah. They moved it. Now it's a Panda Express. Okay. I used to love that theater. Shout out to Panda Express. <laughs> um, not really. Uh, so yeah, I mean differences. There's all kinds of them. I mean, it's just it's like a, basically a satire of it. But yeah, there were more scenes in the in the movie this time than I expected to be from the book. Just like the, the uh, like the speech from the teacher. Yeah. Even though it's a different character they that's combine, doing it. They, they combine two Sort of combine, characters. yeah. The, uh, there's the, uh, the... The recruiter is kind of the same. Yeah, a little The bit. same character. The dad, like, his dad's reaction to him signing up is kind of similar. Um... And so there, there are moments you can recognize Starship yeah. Troopers, the book, in there, but it's just like, but all the the psychic shit and the the brain bug and all that. Yeah, yeah. that's that's all not. <laughs> yeah, but what I will say that did the, that come from like the the old uh, whatever that other script was, or was uh, that just that, the bug hunt? Yeah, at Outpost Nine or whatever it was. Yeah, I don't know. Or was that just that whole scene? Uh, when they go to the the place where they everyone's dead, to that outpost. Oh, that could have been yeah, because that's not in the that's straight. That's not out of the movie at all. Yeah, where the general's hiding in the closet. Yeah, and like I had to hide in the closet because I had important information. <laughs> We're all gonna die. And Ironside punches him. <laughs> Kowatu. Kowatu. And uh, so I mean, there's a there's a shout out right there. Yeah, which they filmed in, um, they filmed all the scenes for that planet in uh, the Badlands of Wyoming. Hmm. Interesting. Um, but, uh, sorry, that was me. Oh. Um, I thought someone was knocking at the door. <laughs> sorry, I just tapped my pen on the book. Um, so, let me think if there's anything. Like, yeah, there are some really funny things in this movie. I like that they play Arena League football Yeah. Um, <laughs> in this. Dizzy is the quarterback, which is kind of interesting. I like when when Rico is not paying attention and she slaps him. Yeah, get your head in the game. So that this is a good time to talk about the differences. So Dizzy yeah. is a is a dude in the book. Um, like dies right away. Right, and so one of the ways that this movie is very different from the book is that they made a bunch of smart decisions in creating character arcs and Hollywoodizing. Including like adding more of a love story. I mean, there was the, there the, the love book. triangle, the love quadrangle, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, the and the movie is is you know it's pretty good. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that people will. I mean, it's like not subtle at all. Nothing subtle in there. No. But in the in the movie, just like in the book, Carmen joins and wants to be a pilot, and that's why Rico wants to join. But they deepen that relationship. And the, well, they're not they're not dating in the in the in the book. book. Yeah, and they're dating in the movie. Played by uh, Carmen is played by Denise Richards, who went on to be a Bond lady. Um, <laughs> oh God, the worst Bond character ever. Right, <laughs> but she's can, she's supposed to be so hot and so beautiful that Rico like is willing to join the military just to be around her. And then the whole thing is that the whole time he's in love with her, Dizzy's in love with him, but he doesn't pay any attention to Dizzy. Right. We, we all are going to agree, right? Dizzy yeah. is way, way, way better. Way better. Way better as a character and, and more attractive as a woman and everything. Yeah. Really more of a fan of Ace. <laughs> oh, Jake Busey's character? Well, he does play violin. He does play fiddle. Right. That's what I'm saying. So, um... And, uh, yeah, and you get some really great scenes of, like, really good character scenes where, like, uh, I love the scene where they're in, they're in the mess hall and they um, are in the, um, 
in the barracks and he gets the transmission from breaking up with Rico. Yeah. And everyone's watching and laughing and making jokes at first. And then uh, basically everyone's like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Yep. I feel sorry for you, Rico. <laughs> Tough shit. Um, that's a really great scene. And um, by the way, we should note, because I think everyone would be interested in this, there's a scene where everyone's talking in the shower together, just having the conversation where they're all, like, making sudsy and whatever. Right. Uh, Paul Verhoeven, getting sudsy. Yeah. Uh, Paul Verhoeven uh, fi- uh, directed that scene naked because... Uh, per the cast the, request. The cast basically said, that if we're going to do this, you should be naked, and they were kind of making a joke, but he did it because... Because he's Paul fucking Verhoeven, and he can do what he wants. <laughs> yeah, he's Paul Verhoeven. Uh, he's not afraid of nudity. <laughs> yeah, he's European, and he said he didn't want the cast to do that um, if he wasn't willing to do it himself. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, we all agree Jizzy's better, um, and so I know from the begin from the first time I saw it, as soon as he like actually hey, that's a, that that kind of goes with the book. Because remember, he talks about the, uh, he talks about their minister or whatever, fighting with them, and you know, mm-hmm. he doesn't understand how other ministers can just sit by and while everyone's in the battle, and then still give them the prayers and everything, right at the beginning of the book. Right, which is another Heinlein like anti pacifist kind of like blah blah. Because, right. Yeah. You never have anyone do something that you wouldn't do yourself, kind of right thing. But, like, certainly Heinlein's not giving respect to the fact that the guy might have, like, a religious belief or whatever. So Of course not. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah, that is the movie. So I, I would say the last, um, I don't know, uh, anything else specifically about the, the movie that you guys wanted to talk about? Um, no, no, not really. Not really. I mean, uh, I mean, it's a childhood favorite for me. Yeah. I like that. Clancy Brown is movie. is a great character, plays a great character, you know. Uh, Michael Ironside plays a great character. I, 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 the Clancy Brown character giving up rank and stuff just so we can fight, you know, that's way better than the dad, like, you know, going to the, fight the, because the he doesn't want emascul- to be a pussy. Yeah, the dad feeling emasculated because his son joined the military and he didn't. Right. What a stupid fucking book. I mean, if you're, if you're drawing, you know, equations between the equalities between the two or what do you call it, David? The parallels? Uh, if yeah. you're drawing parallels, that yeah. is sort of the parallel there. So here's going to be the fun, the funniest part to consider that we do in all the story versus film episodes. Would Heinlein have liked this movie? Oh, absolutely not. And he would have hated it for all the reasons I fucking love it. Yeah. Because it lampoons his stupid pro up its own ass military ideology (laughs) and just drives it into the ground. I hate this book. And so did the guy who directed the movie, which is really interesting. That's just Paul Verhoeven's my boy. Yeah. So here's the thing. Could you imagine if Heinlein had still been alive? Oh, oh man! And if he was sitting in the theater watching this, I mean, one of the reasons they could do this movie at all is because I like was already dead, right? You know, because they don't have anyone to be like. I mean, a lot of people who were fans of the book like bash the movie, of course, sure. yeah. But um, you know, I and there's a lot to you know. It is a really cheesy, a lot of really sort of uh, uh, let us just say uh, not very good acting. Not very good dialogue in the movie, but it you know it's still a lot. It's still a lot of fun. It's not the best movie ever made, but yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a I lot. Like, I like. In books. other words, there's a lot to criticize, even if you never read the book. I like both, um, but I I like them for different reasons, <laughs> and um, you know, I, yeah, it's weird. But anyways, <laughs> so. Um, and one of the things I didn't mention was just how offensive, I forgot to mention this, but how funny it is that the bugs and how communal the bugs like are with their queen and everything. Yeah. It's just such a heavy handed analogy right. for the right. communists. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I don't know. Um, how many 
so let's start with the book first. Okay. Um, how many mech suits out of five are you giving this this book, Larry? I, you know, I think I have to give it uh, two and a half space marines. Okay. Cut one of those marines in half, just like they did in the movie. Cut a bunch of marines in half in that. But the, uh, you know, I I'm not as vehement about the uh, about the jingoistic aspect as you guys. But I just I don't like being preached at in general, no matter what the view is. And it the the flow of the book is ruined by just all that stuff about all those speeches. You know, just tell me the fucking story. And that's all I wanna that's all I want. Uh, you know, I love the action parts. Not enough of that. Uh, could have been some better characters, but you know, it, it just it, it wasn't that great. Let's put it that way. All right, I'm gonna give it um, four mech suits out of five for the novel. Wow, because I do think that it broke a lot of ground that didn't exist at the time. Um, I think that I liked the lived-in nature of the war parts. Um, I didn't agree with any of the message at all, but um, I do think in the context of what Heinlein was setting out to do, it's an interesting read in that sense. And um, I don't know that... But, uh, it, it, well, we didn't... Okay, here's one thing. You know, we, we talk about how much it, it sucks, but the... Uh, the viewpoints, but there's stuff in there that I do agree with. Like, you should, don't you think you should have some sense of ownership of of where you live and and your part in the society? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a very podcast. I think that's a very strong part of the of the book and his message. You know, even though it, he goes about it entirely the wrong way, but the. I, I, there's things like that I agreed with. I just wanted to get that in there. Okay. Um, Anthony, I know how many Space Marines out of five you're giving this. No. <laughs> I don't even know. How many, space... ped, how many pedantic fucking pro-military lectures out of five <laughs> am, I getting, am I giving this? I'm going to give it one pedantic military lecture wow. out of five. I wasn't even sure you'd get up. One, because it's a book, and it was written. It's complete. And it was, it's complete, <laughs> and it does a thing. Um, but it's so preachy. It's so, it's so pointlessly dense when it doesn't need to be for such a short book. Yeah. The characters are blank slates and not terribly interesting. And, I, you know, I don't really care about Johnny Rico's journey through boot camp because I never saw Johnny Rico grow into anything more than a brainwashed fucking drone. And... That's where I'm. I'm dying on. I am dying on this hill for this. <laughs> with this for my opinion on this book, Be, because yeah. it, it, it. I've read books I don't like, but very few books have I ever felt like it was a waste of my goddamn time reading. And this is one of them. Wow. I love the movie, but obviously I would love the movie. Yeah. All right. Um, so, I so, do, and I do it, think that you I'm, don't want to give it any points for like. I gave it one. Well, I, okay, that that's for being a complete book. For being a complete and, book. And sort of and being, the, being the progenitor of, of space of, military fiction. And, yeah, and, 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 and being adapted into one of my favorite childhood movies. Um, <laughs> but the, movie for, the, the book for me would have started when they get ranked up because everybody yeah. else is dead, and a better movie would have shown me Johnny Rico going through that mission and what he's learned, and if he found that, kind of dying for his right. country was the most important thing for him and being a, a man of where he came from was was that was the most important be all end all thing then at least I felt like I would feel like that journey was earned but here it's just I'm watching this dickhead go through boot camp and then I gotta watch his dad cry about being embarrassed that his son did a thing he didn't do <laughs> so fuck it one out of five fuck this book I hate it wow all yeah, right I took it there I'm bringing it out all the hot takes. <laughs> so I can't wait to read Stranger in a Strange Land. I'm sure that's just Heinlein's xenophobic opus. <laughs> it's actually not. 
<laughs> I know. I'm just being <laughs> fucking facetious at this point. Okay, and so how would you rate uh, the film? Uh, oh, Starship Troopers the film. Am I rating it as an adaptation or just as a movie? As a movie. Five out of five. I fucking love the movie. It's wow. fun. It's it. I'm gonna give it five Michael Ironsides out of five. <laughs> it, and I yeah, that is me having nostalgic childhood love for this movie. It's fun. It's gory. It has Michael Ironside. I'm here for this movie all the time. Okay. Even though you fucking despise the book. Oh, despise the book. But part of the reason I love the movie so much is how much the movie is basically pissing on the book. Yeah, shits on the book. So you, know what, you know what you get out of Takes a big dump on the movie? Book. Every time somebody says, well, the book's always better than the movie. Yeah. You can now point to Starship Troopers. You have a prime example. You have a prime example you can pull out of your book. You can you can use Starship Troopers. Um, I am going to give Starship Troopers the film uh, four out of five um, cows eaten by an arachnid. <laughs> uh, censored, um, but uh, partially I'm going to give it four out of five because still some of the special effects are pretty corny and some of it is just. Um, yeah, I'm just to be realistic. I mean, there's just some moments that are just not super awesome, right? But I and I wasn't quite as young as you when I saw it the first time, so but it I doesn't it. doesn't quite have that same influence. Yeah, I mean, I still loved it. I had a great time seeing it in the theater and at the Free Theater in Syracuse. Hmm. Well, I'm gonna give it four out of five brain bugs. Because uh, it's a fucking fantastic satire, and it's it's intelligent and, and brilliant in many ways, but there's some lacking in acting and dialogue, and uh, you know some of the more there's some cringy cringy acting moments in this movie, but not from Rue McClanahan or Michael Ironside. No, no, both of them are pitch perfect. Just yeah, Casper Van as, as is terrible. as is Dina Dina Meyer. What? But the uh, Casper Van Dien, I said she was perfect. Oh okay, yeah. Denise Richards though was oh, she was just terrible. fucking awful. She was really bad. You know, Jake Busey was great. Jake Busey was good. Neil Patrick Harris was good, even though he had some of the worst lines in the movie. Yeah, but he he delivered them with the tongue in cheek. Yeah, that's right. So, so that's it. Uh, all right. So, on that note, uh, we'll stranger in a strange land. See a stranger in a strange land. Thanks for joining the Eyeliners. I'm gonna hang out with my harsh mistress, the moon. The moon. <laughs> and puppet mastered. Oh, with my mistress on the moon. Oh, if man. I have spacesuit, we'll travel. <laughs> oh, 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 good night. Control yourself, General. I can't! I can't! We should just shoot them! Uh, Lieutenant! He's just a little out of his mind, sir. Come on! Warm it all up! Everything you've got! <laughs>